<laughs> okay, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present some work here. They've also set me a very challenging task. They have asked me to... The first half of my talk is supposed to be pedagogical, the second half is supposed to be research. So let me see what I can do. You already know the title of my talk. And uh, let me first begin by, you know, giving my best wishes to Professor Srini Vasan, Srini to all of us, who inspires us in, in many different ways. Some fraction of the audience should understand what's written on the screen. Those of you who don't, I can give you a translation during lunch. Okay. All right, I would also like to begin by thanking various people from whom I have learned the subject. All the people in red are my students, past, you know, present, and not future, of course. Okay, and some uh, good friends of mine who are from the turbulence community you will recognize, and then Michael Wartis, my thesis advisor, who has taught me all the statistical mechanics that I know, and uh, that informs all our studies of turbulence, at least in my group. So uh, here's an outline of my talk, fluid turbulence with pictures, uh, uh, then some equations and some statistical properties and uh, then binary fluid turbulence. So uh, even before we started doing science, there were artists who did many things. Here is an old Indian miniature depicting uh, monsoon clouds. That's the rag Malhar, it's a monsoon rag. That's uh, Leonardo da Vinci, that's a well-known uh, uh, sketch of eddies, and that's the great wave uh, due to Hokusai. All right, then when you get to the lab, you can have uh, turbulent flows in many settings. I'm showing you here some flows in a soap film. You see these beautiful vertical structures, and perhaps I'll tell you a little more later how you can uh, convert all these into quantitative measurements. Then you can liberate particles in the flow. The simplest particles are neutrally buoyant Lagrangian tracers, and here is a trajectory of such a tracer in a two-dimensional flow taken from a direct numerical simulation in our group. <clears throat> then <coughs> I think you saw many such uh, pictures in Professor Narasimha's talk. This is the wake behind the cylinder as the, uh, you know, the fluid goes from here to there past the cylinder and you get a very interesting be <coughs> behavior behind the cylinder. Then if you go through, let the fluid go through a grid, then it breaks up into many, many different eddies and turbulent flows. And over here, the turbulence is to a very good approximation, homogeneous and isotropic, that was the, uh, whatever, deep thinking part of Professor Narasimha's uh, talk, okay, and that is what we will concentrate on in this, uh, uh, this lecture. <clears throat> and the dimensionless number which governs whether a fluid is, is turbulent or not is the Reynolds number RE, which is a typical length scale L, typical velocity scale u divided by the kinematic viscosity nu. All right, more things. I mean, there's huge interest in uh, particles and turbulent flows. Many of the experts are in the audience here. I mean, here is, for example, Mount St. Helens, uh, you know, uh, uh, erupting, and you can see all the ash going up. This uh, has many significant uh, consequences for flights. There's turbulence in the sun. You heard some of it in Arnob's talk. This has to do more with solar flares, which can lead to radio blackouts. Then boundary layer turbulence. Your turbulent fluid flows across the boundary, and you saw this picture already in Professor Narasimha's talk. Then plumes in certain convection, you know, a plate heated from below, and there's a cold thing, and then it, you first get rolls and uh, then you get these turbulent plumes. I think you will hear about this later today in Professor Arkeri's talk, which is at the end of the day. Then the turbulence in jets. I show you a classic picture of inst instability of an axisymmetric jet. And then you get uh, vorticity filaments in turbulent flows, and they can often be seen by seeding the flow with small bubbles. And you see this is, a, I think, a, a vortex tube, and there's something here too. And it turns out that uh, 
One of the authors of this paper is in the audience, Marc Etienne Frachet. He says it's the only experimental paper on which he has his name. Okay, so you can ask him all the hard questions there. You see these vertical filaments also in direct numerical simulations of the equations of fluid dynamics, which I will introduce in a second. I show you these pictures from uh, quite iconic in the trade by the group of Canada. Uh, who did this uh, 1496 cube simulation, I'll tell you what that means, on the then world's fastest computer. And you see this sort of forest of green, and if you zoom in to that, then you see some more structure. And if you go in there, you see these uh, filaments. These are filaments in, uh, you know, you make isovorticity contours, and uh, if the cutoff is reasonably high, you see these filaments, but already the even bigger simulations show even more detail. Professor Jung is here, he's done 8192 cubed, and he sees even more complicated structures. Professor Srinivas is also an author of that paper. So, as you can see, there are challenges for everyone. There are challenges for engineers, characterization and control of turbulent flows, such as flows in pipes or over cars and aeroplanes. And you heard Professor Narasimha talk about these uh, gas turbines. There are very serious challenges. And of course, then there are challenges for mathematicians. They would like to prove, for example, the smoothness or lack thereof of solutions, let us say, of the Navier-Stokes and related hydrodynamical equations, which I will introduce presently. But as Professor Narsimha said, you know, the world can't wait for them to prove, you know, existence, uniqueness, and smoothness. Uh, Boeings have to fly, and uh, so that the engineers take care of. But there are challenges also for many other uh, branches of science, for example, fluid dynamicists, astrophysicists, you heard in Arnob's talk earlier today, geophysicists, perhaps later you might hear about some geophysical uh, flows, climate scientists, plasma physicists, and so on. I will concentrate principally on the statistical characterization of fluid turbulence. I will just tell you what sorts of measures are used to characterize turbulent flows, and then in the so-called research part of the talk, I will apply some of these methods to the characterization of flows that occur in binary fluid turbulence. And I will at least also give you a flavor of the sorts of theorems that mathematicians prove by trying to put up proofs, or at least their statements, for the binary fluid case. All right. The lessons that we learn from various... Uh, experiments and numerical simulations is that we really need a probabilistic description of turbulence. I mean, you can see this enunciated clearly in the book by Uriel Frisch. I mean, basically, velocity signals from a turbulent flow are disorganized. They are unpredictable in their detailed behavior. But if you look at some average properties of these velocity signals, they are reproducible from experiment to experiment. Other lessons that are learned is that the large spatial scales, these are, as you will see, these are the scales at which we inject energy into the system, they contain most of the energy. The small scales, known as the inertial and dissipation ranges, I will explain as we go along. At these small scales, the turbulence is homogeneous and isotropic, statistically speaking, to a good approximation if we stay far away from boundaries. So if you remember this picture I showed you about flow behind a grid, uh, a few, whatever, grid lengths down from there, uh, from the grid, it's pretty homogeneous and isotropic. It also turns out that in the inertial range of scales, there are various quantities which I will define as we go along, energy spectra and structure functions <coughs> that exhibit power laws, which, if you're not too demanding, have universal exponents, which are reminiscent of critical phenomena for those of you who have a st statistical physics background. If you don't, uh, you can uh, edit that statement out of the talk. Okay, as probably all of you know, the fluid flows are governed by the Navier-Stokes equation, and we will restrict ourselves to low Mach number flows, so uh, we will use the incompressibility condition, so that's the equation. I think all of you have seen that several times. 
U is the Eulerian velocity, P is the pressure, nu the kinematic viscosity, rho the density, F the external force, and this divergence U equal to zero uh, imposes the incompressibility constraint. And again, the Reynolds number, sorry, that should be R equal to UL over nu, all right? Now, these equations are very old. In fact, uh, the Euler equation, which is the same equation without viscosity, was discovered, uh, I don't know, 260-something years ago, all right? And then Navier first wrote down the Navier-Stokes equation where viscosity was introduced, and then Stokes also played some role, so it's called the Navier-Stokes equation. All right. Uh, if the Reynolds number is high, the fluid goes into a state of turbulence, and for the rest of this talk, I will only consider a homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So there is a picture which goes back to Richardson of a cascade that in a, such a turbulent flow, there are these large eddies of vortical structures. They break down successively into smaller and smaller daughter eddies until they get to a scale where viscous dissipation becomes significant. If you look at the equations, you will see that the viscosity term comes with a del squared, whereas the advection term is u dot grad u, and therefore clearly this will act at much smaller scales uh, in a significant way, uh, and therefore your dissipation will set in at small scales. So at least in three dimensions, there will be an energy flux, from large length scales L, which if you think in Fourier space, is low wave number K to small L or high K, okay? And the Kolmogorov, whose photograph you see here, uh, by, you know, making some uh, very, very ingenious hypotheses, first suggested that the energy spectrum EK which is the amount of energy contained in uh, between k and k plus dk, uh, which you can get from the velocity field if you solve the Navier-Stokes equation, suggested that this goes as k to the minus five-thirds. This is known as Kolmogorov's 1941 law, k41 for short. For k in the so-called inertial range, so k inverse is a length, this K inverse must be much less than the large scale L at which you put in energy into the system, and the small spatial scale eta sub d, known as the dissipation scale, at which uh, viscous losses are significant. So often people plot, I'm sorry you cannot see this very well, an energy spectrum EK versus K on a log-log plot, then in this part you see a minus five-third spectrum. There are other things here which I will not discuss today. Uh, this is the inertial range over which you see a minus five-third spectrum. And if you do a low-level uh, direct numerical simulation, which is shown here, you can see that that dashed line is the minus five-thirds, and then <clears throat> there is the spectrum. Of course, you can do much, much better on the big computers that people use today. All right? So at this level, it's a minus five-thirds law. There are theoretical reasons for believing that there will be corrections to that, and these come from experiments first, which led to a certain theory. So those experiments often begin by measuring what are called order p equal time structure functions. For this talk, we will only do equal time, so you can erase equal time from that sentence. What is this structure function? You begin by taking the velocity field at the point x plus r, subtract from it the velocity field at the point x, you call that a velocity increment, since you don't want to deal with vectors, let us say you take its longitudinal component by dotting it with r over r. You call that delta u parallel. Then you take this delta u parallel, the longitudinal increment, raise it to the power p. Those angular brackets mean a, an average over the statistically steady state of forced turbulence. And you find that it goes as r to a power 
zeta sub p. So this power depends on the order p, okay? And all this again for lengths r that are in the inertial range that I just defined. Much smaller than the energy injection scale, much larger than the dissipation scale. All right? <clears throat> okay, if you ask what does the K41 theory imply for this uh, power zeta sub p, it's the same theory which gave the minus five thirds for the energy spectrum, you will find p divided by three. Is that correct? Well, experiments which are plotted here, I hope you can see that, that's a plot of zeta p versus p. If Kolmogorov had been right, you would get this straight line, which is p divided by three. Uh, the best measurements, best numerical simulations, I haven't put the error bars, but you know, they show significant deviations, especially when you go beyond p equal to three. And these deviations, for this the purposes of this talk, we will call multi-scaling, and they were first rationalized by Uriel Frisch, who you see here, lecturing actually at ICTS, and uh, <clears throat> Giorgio Parisi, okay? This multi-scaling arises because of, of many things. I mean, uh, you know, there's this picture of the Richardson cascade, big eddy breaking into smaller and smaller eddies, and, but the, um, the suggestion is that, that the total area covered by the eddies is the same. If you allow for spottiness or intermittency in that energy dissipation, then you can try to uh, argue that you must have such multi-scaling. And in particular, for the energy dissipation, you can't see this very clearly. I have tried to get it from a classic paper by and Menevo and Srinivasan, Srinivasan is here, Menevo is supposed to be here soon. Uh, this is a plot you can't see very well, so let me just tell you. On the vertical axis is the energy dissipation of the fluid, okay? Measured locally in some way by some nice probe. And on the horizontal axis is either time or space. You go along and you see this very, very highly intermittent function. Okay, and this is one of the signatures of fluid turbulence in many other types of turbulence, uh, which go require going beyond the simple K41 theory. And in this very nice paper, you know, there is also a very nice uh, pedagogical section. So if you haven't uh, learned how to uh, do multifractal analysis, please look at this paper. Don't get lost in the technical sections, but there are very nice pedagogical sections which tell you how to characterize such intermittency by using what's called an F versus alpha spectrum. But today I don't have enough time to do it in a slow fashion, so I highly recommend this paper. All right, I showed you some flows in two-dimensional soap films. For those, you can use a two-dimensional variant of the Navier-Stokes equation. So that's again, I've written it again, incompressible. <clears throat> but in this case, it is advantageous to use the vorticity omega, which is curl of u, to write down the equations in the what's called the vorticity stream function notation. And then <clears throat> del squared psi, psi is the stream function, which is related to u, the components of u in this way. And then you get a nice way of writing the equations. Now it turns out that what I told you about the power laws in three-dimensional turbulence don't hold in two-dimensional turbulence. And one of the reasons for that, the principal reason for that is that if you look at two-dimensional turbulence in the inviscid unforced limit, the viscosity equal to zero, forcing equal to zero, in addition to the energy, which is basically mod u squared integrated over the whole volume, in addition to that, you have another conserved quantity, which is called enstrophy, which is the mod squared of the vorticity omega. All right, and this was first realized, well, by, by, by Creighton essentially, I think, though there were some inklings of it even before that, <clears throat> that uh, this uh, extra conservation law 
will lead to essential differences in the energy spectrum in two dimensions. So that's Krechnan. I think this is when he got the award in ICTP. And this is, uh, again, log of the energy spectrum versus K. And if you force the fluid here at this wave number scale, then you find an inverse cascade of energy. Remember, in the... Uh, uh, in the 3D fluid turbulence case, the energy was cascading from large length scales to small length scales. Here you have an inverse cascade, and when you work out the details, it leads again to a k to the minus 5 thirds power in the inverse cascade regime. And then there is a forward cascade of entropy, which is mirrored in this energy spectrum with a k to the minus 3 power. If there is no friction, I say that perhaps only for the experts, <laughs> often, I mean, how do you realize such two-dimensional uh, things in the lab? For example, you can get an electromagnetically forced soap film, and then you can excite it using some array of magnets. Uh, you, you can look at this uh, PhD thesis if you want uh, a, a nice pedagogical introduction to this. This is the thesis of Rivera. <clears throat> And uh, again, if you restrict yourself to low Mach number flows, which means the RMS velocity is much less than the velocity of sound, and then you can convince yourself that to leading order, these soap films are, are described by the two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation. These terms you will recognize from what we have done already. This symbol here is a so-called convective derivative that is partial with respect to t plus u dot grad, p is the pressure, u the velocity, and over here is a new term, minus alpha u, which is a friction. For the 2D uh, film case, you can think of that as uh, some air, air drag induced friction, other physical settings, it's bottom friction and so on. But this term, which was not there in the three-dimensional equations, is important in the two-dimensional equations. And actually, if you put it in and go back to this spectrum, then if there is friction, this spectrum is steeper than k to the minus 3. But that's only if you work in this area. So again, you often... Uh, write the 2D equations in terms of this vorticity, omega, and stream function psi formula, uh, formulation. And if you have an external force, you add the external force, and you see the friction here. In this uh, way of writing the equations, incompressibility is satisfied by construction, and if there are walls, you use no-slip boundary conditions. So let me give you a rough idea of how you solve these equations. Uh, well, how you solve them depends on the uh, physical situation you are trying to address. <laughs> so, for example, suppose you have a wall-bounded flow, then you want to impose conditions properly at the walls, and then you have to use a numerical scheme that is suitable for that. If you want to study homogeneous natrotropic turbulence, it turns out that it is advantageous to use what is called a pseudospectral method. Roughly speaking, what does that mean? It means that, you see, if you were to take a Fourier transform of that equation, then all of you know that del squared would become minus k squared, so derivatives are very easy to evaluate in, uh, sorry, in, in real space, excuse me, in Fourier space, but then products that you have, uh, you should evaluate them in, in uh, uh, real space, in, in physical space, because those products are local in uh, real space. If you try to evaluate them in Fourier space, you have to do a costly convolution, which you don't want to do. And all this is made possible by a wonderful uh, algorithm called the fast Fourier transform algorithm, which uh, is uh, sort of n log n if you have n collocation points. I used to think that it was invented by Cooley and Tukey in that Bell Labs. Turns out that Gauss knew about it, <clears throat> but of course Gauss didn't have computers, so he just had his own brain. <clears throat> okay, so be that as it may, this is at the heart. This fast Fourier transform algorithm is at the heart of all these pseudospectral <clears throat> 
calculations. Given that you can solve these equations, from these equations you get the velocity field u, you get the vorticity omega, and from those you can study the energy spectra, you can study the evolution of the energy, you can study the dissipation rate epsilon, and you can see, for example, in the dimensional case, you could ask, how do these depend on parameters like the friction alpha and the kinematic viscosity nu? Okay? Uh, there are various things you can do. You probably can't see this, but you don't need to look at details. All I'm trying to show you is that if you carry out such a pseudospectral direct numerical simulation, then you can get plots. This is of the energy versus time, the dissipation versus time, and so on. All these were done by Prasad Perlikar, my former student uh, for his PhD thesis. He's supposed to lecture on Monday, so if you have any questions, you can ask him. And then you can, uh, you know, obtain uh, these structure functions that I told you. So they depend on, uh, you know, uh, various things. They depend in particular on the separation. So over here you see for this two-dimensional case the second-order structure function, and it depends on some center R, but to get better statistics, if you average over the center, then uh, you can get these nice plots. And these are only good pictures. You can quantify it by numbers. And then by looking at the behavior, the dependence of these structure functions on the separation R, you can begin to calculate the exponent zeta p that I told you about. So I show you such plots for the forward cascade part, where the entropy is going forward in two dimensions. This is again from Prasad's work. And you can't see all the details, but take my word for it that from the slopes of these plots, you get a plot in the inset of a scale zeta p versus p, and there seems to be a straight line. So as far as anyone can tell, at least within numerical error, the velocity structure functions in two dimensions do not show multiscaling. However, again, if you keep track of the signs and you worry about your error bars, there is a defensible case for the vorticity structure functions showing multiscaling in two-dimensional turbulence. This is just to give you some feeling for the sorts of calculations that you can do. All right, let me pause now. I have told you what I wanted to tell you about the, in the pedagogical part. I have given you some examples of the statistical measures that are used, like energy spectra, you know, the temporal evolution of the energy, the energy dissipation, structure functions, and so on. Uh, so now I can show you how to apply it to the binary fluid turbulence case. But if you have any questions now about the previous part, now's a good time to ask. Yes. Pretty case, it's not, you know, the surfaces are outside and it's just not there as far as I can tell. I mean, it's not just, it's never there. The whole 2D film, let's take this case of the soap film. That's in contact with air, okay? So, so that's there, right there, all, all over. But in the bulk, there is no friction, I mean, as far as I know. I mean, the experimentalists in the audience can give you a better answer. Yeah, yeah right. <clears throat> Sorry? Yeah, but that is, you're going to, uh, liquid metal, you said. Ah, right. Yeah, but that's 2D? You're doing to. Okay, but liquid metal, you have to go to MHD, you have to do what? Uh... Okay, fine, all right. So in, in some liquid metal flows, you might have to add that. Hmm? Okay. Sure, but that's porous media. Okay. Another, uh, that's a very interesting thing. If you, you know, make a fluid flow through a porous medium, then this term arises, even if it's a 3D porous medium. Okay? All right. Any other questions? Okay. So let me tell you a little bit beyond what's in the textbooks. This is, again, work done with Prasad Perlekar, uh, Noirita Pal, my former students, Anupam Gupta, and John Gibbon, who's a real expert in proving theorems. <clears throat> so I will also show you an example of uh, the sort of theorem 
uh, sort of challenges that exist in this trade. So these are uh, some papers that we have published on it. The papers in blue have to do with our numerical simulations of various uh, you know, uh, situations, the physical situations in uh, two, two, two phase flows. And then uh, these are the ones which have the theorems. Okay, so first I'll begin by giving you some examples of binary fluid flows. And then I will make a case for using what are called the Kahn Hilliard Navier Stokes equations to model these flows. Then I will give you examples of some solutions of these equations, both in two dimensions and three dimensions. And then I will give you examples of regularity criteria, first for the three dimensional Euler equation, and I will show that you can come up with similar regularity criteria for solutions of the uh, 3D Kahn Hilliard Navier Stokes equation. Okay? So that's the plan of this half of the talk. So there are many, many multiphase flows. There are, uh, you know, uh, there are raindrops inside clouds, so you really have two, uh, two phases. Uh, you know, many people model them in different ways because it's an, it's an extreme challenge. Uh, I mean, you know, the raindrops can be micron size and the cloud is 10 kilometers. Uh, you know, nobody can build a computer big enough to s simulate the whole cloud, so you have to put in things by hand. Okay, then there are droplets of all sort. There are sort of oil in water droplets. You might ask, how do these behave in a turbulent flow? Uh, there is a very important uh, technology, inkjet printers, which have these small droplets. Okay, these uh, might often, they might be turbulent, but in complete many microfluidic devices, they are not turbulent. And then you can have bubbles in a real turbulent flow. One of the biggest facilities is in Twente, where I'm told the, uh, the Taylor Quet thing goes through three floors of a building. So again, you know the equations for the fluid part. If there were only one fluid, you would still have Navier-Stokes, which I have written down, again, incompressible. I think the notations are the same as above. And if it is two dimensions, you can add a friction coefficient alpha. In three dimensions, we will set the friction equal to zero. Now, first, let's forget about Navier-Stokes. If you're a statistical mechanician like me, you will say, if I have a binary fluid mixture, uh, then uh, the Kahn Hilliard uh, set of equations give us a very way, a nice way of understanding uh, these mixtures. And at the level of pictures, uh, okay, let me just pause a little bit. If you have a binary fluid mixture, let's say oil and water, you can take it above some critical temperature, then the fluids will mix. If you take it below that critical temperature, they will unmix. Okay, and uh, uh, you can, for example, quench from the high temperature phase to the low temperature phase. Then you will begin with some picture like this, where the red and the blue fluids are mixed, and then below the critical temperature, they are phase separating. This is often called coarsening in the metallurgy literature and so on. The simplest way of describing this is in terms of what is called an order parameter field phi, where phi is a scalar order parameter, and its uh, equilibrium is governed by the so-called Landau-Ginzburg functional. Those of you who like to think of magnetic systems, phi is the order parameter that would distinguish an upspin phase from a downspin phase in this binary fluid uh, context. Uh, you know, phi close to plus one is the A-rich phase, phi close to minus one is the B-rich phase, and uh, there is this uh, double well potential, I'll tell you what that means in a minute, and as you go from one phase to the other, phi changes continuously across the domain wall or interface. So if you look at this double well potential, it looks like this, Roughly speaking, you try to minimize that free energy. If you have no spatial variation, you have one minimum in the units I've chosen, which is minus one, and another minimum, which is a plus one. These are the two coexisting phases. Minus one, let us say, is the B-rich phase, and 
plus one is the A rich phase. Now let's allow for some spatial variation. In particular, let us say that on at y equal to minus infinity, I impose that the fluid should be B rich, and at y equal to plus infinity, it is A rich. And let me say there are no fluctuations in the um, dimensions transverse to this. Then the analog of minimizing this, it's a very elementary exercise in uh, okay, functional derivative, if you like. Uh, for the equilibrium interface, you take a functional derivative of f with respect to phi, so at it equals zero, you get the second order differential equation, which given the two boundary conditions at minus infinity and plus infinity, which are plus or minus one, you can solve, and you get a tangent hyperbolic profile. For people in statistical mechanics, this is the equilibrium. This is the simplest e theory for the equilibrium interface. But now you want a multi-phase turbulent flow, so you need to couple this uh, order parameter phi to your velocity field here. And let me not try to write down every term in this. Uh, explain every term in this. It turns out that this scalar field phi is what an expert would call an active scalar insofar as it affects the velocity field. And then, of course, it is affected by the velocity field too, okay, through this convective derivative. These are convective derivatives, del by del t plus v dot grad, okay? And this term mu is the chemical potential which is related to the functional derivative of that free energy functional that I wrote down. You can ask, what are the control parameters here? When we were doing nice, wonderful turbulence, we just had the Reynolds number. Now, well, you have to worry about many things. You have to worry about the surface tension, which is measured in a dimensional form by the Weber number. You have to worry about the width of the interface, where the appropriate dimensionless parameters are Kahn number, and so on. Okay? So, you can now solve this in the same way that I said we solve the, I, I gave you an example of two-dimensional by pseudospectral method. So it's all written down, you have a periodic box, you have grid points, and so on. From a technical point of view, you see there are many way, people who do uh, multi-phase flows in many different ways. I strongly advocate the kahn hilliard navier stokes system because you do not have to impose boundary conditions on the moving boundary of the droplet. Here, that's all taken care of by the scalar field phi. It's not a sharp boundary, phi varies to the interface. The only extra, extra cost you pay is to follow the spatiotemporal evolution of the field phi itself. But having done that, you're in business, okay? All right, so instead of giving you details, let me just show you pictures. By choosing parameters suitably, you can get into a regime where you have one droplet in a turbulent flow. So let me show you what that looks like for the two-dimensional case. Oops. Okay, that's the droplet. It's fluctuating. The fluctuations are because of turbulence. The amount of A phase and B phase is conserved, uh, given the way we have set it up. Oops, what happened? Okay. Just a second, sorry. You can do more than that too. You know, a very important problem in multi-phase flows, which also have gravity in them, is the so-called Rayleigh-Taylor instability. In the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, you begin by putting a heavy fluid on top of a light fluid. Then the heavy fluid wants to come down. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of experiments and simulations of this. All I want to show you is the kahn hilliard navier stokes system is good enough to get this too. Okay, so here you see gravity is acting along the z-axis and you see this instability developing and this is just straight in the kahn hilliard navier stokes You can study the coalescence of two droplets. This is in a laminar flow. You see these two droplets uh, coalescing. Not surprisingly, the coalescence is more complicated when the flow is turbulent, okay? So, and given the parameters in the problem, you really have to work very hard 
to find out what sorts of physics occurs in what sort of parameter space. Uh, and we have tons and tons of results, so many that we haven't written up all our papers, some we have. But let me show you a few things. I told you that this uh, droplet is active, that is, it affects the flow. So let's look at what it does to the energy spectrum. This purple line here is what you would have had had you only had a single phase flow, good old Navier-Stokes turbulence. But now you added the droplet which acts on this through the field phi and it actually pushes up the spectrum. Okay, I can explain the reasons for that offline. It's too technical to dis uh, discuss here, but for those of you who know, it is similar to how a polymer acts on a turbulent flow. Then if you look carefully, you see these oscillations in this blue curve, they're visible. So you somehow think that the droplet is leading to these uh, oscillations, and indeed you would be right to assume that. And it shows up much better if you look at the spectrum for the phi field, which a condensed matter physicist call a structure factor. So S of k would be phi k, phi minus k, uh, mean value in the statistically steady state of turbulence. And here you see the oscillations very nicely in the case when you have a more or less circular droplet, which happens when you have a high surface tension. If you have a low surface tension, the droplet fluctuates much more, and some of these oscillations get wiped out. So this is how, if you like, the turbulent affects, affects the, uh, the droplet. This is how the droplet affects the turbulence. So with this Khan hilliard navier stokes setup and the ability to do pseudospectral simulations, you can begin to study uh, uh, these effects which, depending on your point of view, are important to fluid dynamics or statistical mechanics, actually they're important for both. Now you can also keep track of the perimeter of the droplet. And let me not tell you, but there is a way of scaling it suitably so that what is plotted on the vertical axis is dimensionless. And this is versus time. And if you remember, the picture I showed you from the Menevo Srinivasan paper of the intermittency of the energy dissipation, you will see that these curves are highly intermittent. The blue is for low surface tension, the red for the highest surface tension. And I said that there is some way of analyzing this using multifractals. So, and I said I don't have time to tell you, but again, we can't tell you uh, in some other setting. And you can actually find the multifractal spectrum, and this shows you that there is multi-scaling in the fluctuations of these droplets, and in a, in a way which you can actually completely characterize within this calculation. All right, then those of you who are mathematically inclined, in five minutes I will tell you what you might worry about. I mean, people worry about this even for the Euler equation. Okay, what does, what, how do they worry? They say, I give you some arbitrary initial data for the velocity. Let's even say it is analytic. Can you tell me or can you not tell me whether the solution will develop a singularity in finite time? Okay, nobody knows the answer. Okay, people like me who simulate probably think there might not be anything. And then, of course, there's the analogous question for the Navier-Stokes problem in three dimensions. And if you solve that, you get a million dollars. The clay math prize goes with that. So that's written here. It's still an open problem for Euler, Navier-Stokes, and not surprisingly, Khan Hilliard, Navier-Stokes. There are various results that are known in two dimensions, which I won't go into here. So this regularity issue, when viewed through the eyes of a mathematician, remains a formidable challenge. So let me tell you what is known quickly. The central theorem in the 3D Euler case is the so-called beal cato maida theorem. I'll say it like a non-mathematician, okay? It begins by defining these objects Hn, which are the, uh, you know, uh, nth derivative acting on u mod squared, and then you consider the velocity, which is curl u, and so on, and then you integrate it, or powers of it, over the whole volume. 
And omega infinity, the so-called omega infinity norm, is the maximum of the vorticity in the domain V. What Beale, Carter, and Maida proved was that for initial data, which are of some level of smoothness, the level of smoothness is, satis is specified by this HN, that this should be meaningful, uh, U naught, the initial data should belong to HN for N greater than three halves and so on. Then what they told you is the only thing you need to keep track of is this integral of omega infinity over time, and if it becomes infinity at time t star, then you have a finite time singularity at time. Conversely, if for every t greater than zero, this integral is bounded above, then the solutions of the 3D Euler equation remain regular on the interval zero to t. Right? What this tells you is that if you're worrying about regularity, you don't need to measure every possible derivative of velocity that you want to keep track of, just look at the vorticity, find its soup norm, and that's all. If, if it passes that test, it's okay. So here is a table made up by John Gibbon of what is known and what is not known for the 3D Navier-Stokes equation. So in, in the notations that I've defined, all these things are known. Sorry, there's an omega missing here, uh, something missing there. Okay, uh, and uh, this is what is required for regularity. So this is where the million dollars lie. Hmm? Okay, for those of you who want to challenge yourselves, okay? But not only because of a million dollars. Hmm? All right, so it turns out that we can prove a similar theorem for the kahn hilliard navier stokes system. You have to define, to specify initial data. You have to define a suitable PN, which has to do with derivatives of the field phi. And then the initial data should be of the velocity type that I already told you, with hn for n greater than 3 halves, and phi naught should be with this n greater than 5 halves, then you don't have to worry about every arbitrary gradient of phi that you have or every arbitrary gradient of u that you have. All you have to do, I will define this E infinity in a second. The E infinity here plays exactly the same role as the omega infinity norm in the previous Euler case. If you can show that it goes to infinity at time t star, then there's a singularity. If it doesn't go to infinity up to time t for that, that integral, then you're fine. And E infinity is basically uh, the energy part or, or, or the, uh, the uh, you know, that free energy that I wrote down. These lambdas and size are just parameters, so that's the L infinity norm of grad phi. And that's the elementary norm of the, there was a phi squared minus one whole squared, that's just that term. And then here, there's a bar missing uh, of, the, of, the, of the velocity, okay? And you can ask, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, that's the old, the same old uh, Hilliard field. And then you can ask in numerical simulations, do you see this? Uh, it is always hard to find uh, soup norms in a, in a, in a simulation, so often what you do is you do higher and higher order norms, so you do m equal to one, two, three, four, and then with some luck they converge, and you take the converged one as your uh, uh, L infinity norm. And we have done that for various flows. These are for the Rayleigh-Taylor instability types of flows that I told you about, but every flow that we have checked, it seems to work, that it's not blowing up. Uh, but of course, clearly, much bigger simulations must be done to check all this in great detail. Meanwhile, I think we can continue to use the kahn hilliard navier stokes equations. The same that Professor Narasimha said, you know, I, I eat, I don't understand how my digestive system, the biochemistry of digestion, but I still eat. So I think uh, if you want to do binary fluid flows, I, I recommend that you use the kahn hilliard navier stokes system. Uh, you can, uh, you know, get a lot out of them, which is physically important. And meanwhile, uh, and the mathematicians will keep on worrying about what they must worry about. I thank you. Now we have time for questions. Yes. No, 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 it's not. It's some uh, finite time. It's, it's not blowing up. We will check. Yeah. yeah it, it, it looks roughly like it does, but it doesn't. Yes.
bit about the uh, what sort of experiments do people try for this problem? Are there experiments? Well, there are lots of experiments. Uh, 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 okay, I'm. Uh, I don't know all the experiments. I'm sure Srinivasan, etc., will know more. But for example, you could ask. You put in such uh, droplets in uh, in a turbulent fluid. Does it lead to drag reduction or uh, uh, something like that? I mean, just like drag reduction by polymer additives. And certainly I think it does, and we have numerical evidence for dissipation reduction because we are not looking at wall-bounded flows. It is appropriate to look at dissipation reduction. I'm sure it will lead to some dissipation reduction, basically because some of the energy goes into the deformation of the droplets, so much like... But there's an important difference between this and polymers insofar as the droplets I'm talking about are inertial range objects rather than polymers which are, you know, sub-dissipation scale. But the change in the spectra and all that are very similar. Yes? In the gas phase is computed by the pressure Poisson equation. Uh, what, how is the pressure inside the droplet computed? And how are the things I like... I don't have to do all that. I mean, you're right. If you were doing it that way, you would have to do it. Everything is about the thermodynamics is contained in my phi field. And to the extent I'm doing a pseudospectral thing for the fluid, I handle the pressure in the usual way. You know, I, if I want the pressure, I can get it by solving a pressure Poisson. But if I write it in the vorticity way, it falls out of the equations. So I don't have to compute the pressure explicitly during my calculation. But then how is the connection, uh, things like Young-Laplace equation where the pressure and the curvature of the droplet are connected? All that all you can ask, and in fact that was asked many, many years ago in the statistical mechanics context. It might even have been by my thesis advisor and uh, Matthew Fisher. They calculate the curvature corrections to the surface tension, which you can do completely within the Kahn Hilliard setup without ever adding any Navier Stokes. Okay? But, but that has been addressed several decades ago. Thanks. Okay, I mean, where it might break down, it might break down numerically, it will certainly break down. Suppose you have very sharp interfaces. And if your numerical scheme is, uh, I mean, you know, you're happy if your interface is spread over five gray, uh, lattice spacings. But if it is going below that, then, well, you should worry. So there are two answers. One is do bigger and better, or uh, whether you want to go to another model, I don't know. But if you go to some other model which treats the two fluids separately, then you have to confront uh, boundary conditions on a moving interface. True, true. So, I did not emphasize that these are these non boussinesque types of things that you... So, this will, strictly speaking, work when the density difference is small. And those of you who know critical phenomena will know that I went only up to the phi to the four term. If I'm very far away from the critical point, I should have other terms. So, all those effects are not there. I mean, certainly, this is not, you know, thermodynamically accurate for the air-water interface or even the oil-water interface, unless you're near the critical point. Yeah. So, what does, how does dimensionality matter? Uh, a lot of slides were 2D. Are there 3D work uh, done? Well, of course, it will matter. There will be an inverse cascade, and all that will set in. Sure. That, that will be there. Uh, right. So, so there's, there's no... This was 2D or 3D? Both. Both. The theorem was 3D. Some of the new simulations were uh, 2D. Some of the simulations were 3D. No, I, I, just, I was just thinking of yes. just the same question, right. a crazier uh, situation, take aniline, cyclohexane, critical yes. mixture, mm -hmm. you go above the critical point and you yes. come back, there's a single fluid and you come back down. Yes. Uh, is there, uh, has anybody looked at that? Problem? Yes, they have. In fact, that was another paper which I didn't talk about, which we've done with Prasad. We did it in uh, 2D and Prasad and the group in Eindhoven did it in 3D. It's called... Uh, uh, you know, arrest of coarsening. So, you know, there are many ways in which coarsening can uh, get arrested. You go below the critical point, then uh, you should get just one interface separating the two. That's an equilibrium. But when the turbulence churns up the fluid, it actually uh, arrests this phase separation, and there is an arrest scale which you can uh, connect in a way that I can tell you later with the Hinze length, which was known from droplet breakup physics, 
and, and many such things. So, so that has been worked out quite in detail, both in 2D and 3D. What causes the phase separation? Okay, I mean, uh, um, below TC, which is uh, the, the simplest example again, in, is the magnetic system, but the fluid system is similar. If you're below TC and you are at the first order phase boundary, then uh, there is, uh, okay, so, so if there are two coexisting phases, strictly speaking, as a statistical mechanician, you would define a surface tension or interfacial tension precisely at coexistence. Now, suppose uh, you are working with fixed amount of A and fixed amount of B, what we would call a conserved order parameter, then why should you pay the interfacial cost of so many little droplets and so on? So you evolve towards a case where uh, you have only one interface. Precisely how you evolve has to do with various theories. Uh, some people call it Oswald ripening, some people call it lifshitz yours law, and then there are you know, late stages of growth and so on. But I can tell you, it's a huge subject. You know, Sanjay Puri at JNU is one of the world's experts on it, but I can tell you offline, I mean, but it'll take a long time to answer. Yes? Sorry, sorry, just speak up louder. Uh, between, it's working, right? Between Navier-Stokes and Carnelier Navier-Stokes, if you see the spectra, it's pushed to the right, right, for the Carnelier. Yes, it comes up in the tail. Uh, the push, does it depend upon the uh, thickness of the interface, or it doesn't depend? Uh, well, we like to believe, it actually it depends on all parameters. There are many, many parameters in the Carnelier Navier-Stokes when you let the dust settle. Okay, so it does depend on Kahn number. Kahn number is the dimensionless measure of the thickness of the interface. So, it also depends on surface tension and many such things, yes. It depends on the thickness of it, so it is an artifact because... No, 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 it's not an artifact. Uh, because, you know, I don't know how I want to say thickness. I mean, uh, as you go towards a critical point, the, uh, at least within mean field theory, the interfacial thickness will scale as the correlation length. So all that is there. It's only the thickness issue, if it's a very sharp interface, at least from my perspective, is probably a numerical resolution issue. Okay. If you can, if it is very sharp, okay, I don't know, but uh, uh, that means you're very far away from the critical point. Yeah, okay. but, but uh, at, at this level, I don't think there's any problem. I have one more question actually. When you are forcing at a larger K, you said there is a reverse cascading, right? In the 2D case. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there will not be any stationary state in this case, no? Because will there be any... Okay, so that again is uh, something that people fight about. The moment you put in friction, that's not an issue. The friction cuts it off at sufficiently small k. Then many people claim that when they ran their simulations longer and longer, there was a slow drift. I like to believe that there is a statistically steady state which was first shown, I, at least in my view, by uh, Mitra and Axel Brandenburg and one of their postdocs whose name I'm forgetting. And they ran it very, very long and the way they could run very, very long is they used uh, GPU processors and I think they have a defensible statistically steady state. I can give you the reference, okay? All right, I should mention that our things were also done on the GPUs and Professor Narasimha was talking about GPUs. Much of our Khan Hilliard work was also done with GPUs. So you are saying that uh, like the energy dissipates in the large scale, the energy that I'm adding in the... Uh, uh, well, I mean, you know, you get a big, uh, when you do a simulation in a periodic box, you get one big drop, uh, one big vortex, and by periodic boundary conditions, an anti-vortex. Yes. And then there are little other vortical excitations and so on. Uh, then in the periodic box, it stays like that. I mean, I, I don't think there's a problem. Of course, I should tell you that experts will fight about this. Okay, thank you. So does uh, turbulence only decrease the length scale of phi, or does it also decrease the amplitude? Amplitude, sorry, which amplitude are you talking about? Oh, phi. Uh, no, well, uh, I mean, the phi total is fixed. Yeah, so phi will fluctuate between plus and minus one approximately, right, as you right. go through the tan hyperbolic. Yes, but if you look at the pictures, uh, you will break it up into little droplets. 
But the total amount of phi is conserved. Sure. We are working with a conserved order parameter. So the magnitude of phi, does that also decrease? Uh, I have to go back and look. I don't think so. I mean, it's… Uh, so in other words, is it uh, mixing the fluid again? I mean, it is. I mean, it, again, answer depends a little bit on parameters where you are. But where we have looked, uh, it just sort of breaks it up into smaller droplets. I mean, that single interface so separating the two… If I integrate phi square over the entire volume… Yeah, that is uh, fixed now by conservation. We are using a conserved order parameter. Right. I mean… No, phi integrated is fixed. Yes. Phi square integrated. Oh, phi squared integrated. Excuse me. Okay, I have to look it up. Okay. I will. So, uh, it con uh, so let's thank uh, uh, Rahul Pandit for giving a, such a wonderful talk. <laughs>